appreciate everyone's presence this evening. I'll invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 13 tonight. We began last week talking about some of the parables. We talked about the parable of the sower, and tonight we want to talk about uh, the parable of the tares. Uh, just appreciate everybody's work today, the good way in which uh, we were led in worship by song leaders and those leading our prayers and comments at the table and things like that, those who work behind the scenes to prepare for today. Not sure who prepared the Lord's Supper this morning, but um, when I got here, it was ready, and somebody did that, and we appreciate it. The building is, is uh, you know, is prepared for us to come and, and worship here. And uh, all of that, of course, is necessary and, and helps make a good service, and I appreciate it a great deal. i just make one comment. I appreciate what Brother Seneca had to say in his prayer to, today. Uh, of course, we're still in the political season, I guess, and uh, a kind of a highly charged political season this, this time around. But I just appreciate him saying that, you know, whatever our political inclinations might be, we, we, our main interest is spiritual. We're interested in the, you know, the, the welfare of God's people. Uh, we want to be a good influence on those who are not God's people. And so whatever our political inclinations are, we sure don't want to behave in such a way that it would hurt our influence with others who might not be children of God. And so we, we just want to make sure that we conduct ourselves at all times, uh, whether it's political season or out of political season, that we, that we do that. We don't hurt our influence with others. And so I just appreciated that, that, that idea. Well, sometimes there's, uh, just think about this for as we introduce the lesson tonight. Sometimes there are children, maybe a lot of times there are children, and uh, the children's parents are strong Christians, mother and father, very dedicated, very committed to, to being a Christian. They live as Christians should live uh, when they're at the building in time for worship or whether they're at home. Uh, they're, they're diligent, they're involved. They're uh, involved in the work of the church. So the, the father might even take a leading role. Maybe he's a Bible class teacher or he leads singing uh, and serves the congregation in those ways. Uh, and maybe this child sees his mother or her mother and she's very involved. She's concerned about uh, the uh, welfare of other members of the church. She's involved in seeing to it that everyone's needs are met as best she can. And so, and so a child grows up in a family and the, the parents are very devout, very, very strong Christians, very actively involved and, and committed. And so he grows up thinking, well, that's pretty much the way everybody must be uh, at church. All, all the adults must be pretty much more or less like, like my parents, very strong, very committed, very devout, very active, uh, maybe some not so much publicly active, but very active as Christians and then as this person grows through adolescence and into adulthood, he becomes more involved himself. He's no longer a child now. Now he's an adult member of the church. And so he's actively involved and he begins to see things that kind of surprise him. He sees that there are some members that they're really not what he thought that they, he thought they were. They have problems with their pride. They have problems with anger. Maybe uh, they have problems with greed, and he can see that, or, or problems with lust. Maybe they, they say things that they shouldn't say. Maybe he sees them behave in ways that he knows that they shouldn't behave. They're not the loving, self-sacrificing disciples committing to doing, committed to doing right that, that he thought that they were. And he sees that in, instead of acknowledging their faults, uh, they're really stubborn about it. And that they're, they're defensive. And instead of being penitent, they try to justify themselves. <laughs> and he sees that, sometimes at least, what a criticism that he's heard made about the church is unfortunately true. They're hypocrites. There are some hypocrites in the church. And he's disappointed by that. You know, he's grown up thinking that everybody was one way in his naivete as a child, and he gets older and he finds out, hey, things are not exactly the way I thought that they were. Now, there are hypocrites in the church. Some of them I know are sitting right over, I don't, I don't mean pointing at anybody in particular, but they're sitting right over there. Well, with some people, they, 
they they give up, they quit. You know, when that when they when they discover those things, they they quit on they quit on Christ. Actually, it's what they end up doing. Well, how how should we react to that when we see that things are not really what what they ought to be? Well, Jesus tells a story or tells a parable that touches on these things at least to some degree. And so let's begin reading in verse twenty four. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. So the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. For a while uh, for a while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. So here are the parable of, of the tares. This, this parable is unique to Matthew's gospel. It's not found in... And Mark or Luke and John doesn't contain these kinds of parables at all. It's one of several parables that has to do with sowing seed. And so the first parable we looked at, the parable of the sower, we read about a man sowing seed in his field. Well, you read about that kind of thing in this parable also. In this chapter a little bit later, Jesus will tell the parable about the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds that produces a, a you know, very big bush or tree, and the birds even come and make their nest there. In Mark chapter 4, and verse 26, Jesus tells a, the, a, a parable about a seed that is planted into the ground, and, and it grows and produces, and the one who plants it really doesn't understand that, that process. There are other parables that have to do with working in the field. Now, the laborers who work for... Wages, you know, some work all day for a certain price, others work only an hour for the same price. And so the laborers in the field, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 and following. There are the wicked workers who uh, don't, uh, don't give to the owner of the field what is due, what's due him in Mark chapter 12 and verse 1. And of course, there's the story of the rich fool whose crops produce bountifully. And, you know, he just had confidence that his life was going to continue on and on. And so he planned to tear down his barns and build bigger barns. But he was foolish because that very night, uh, his, his soul was required. Well, I bring all of that up just to make this point that Jesus spends a lot of his time in, in Galilee, not in the city of Jerusalem, not in a, an urban area. Of course, there are cities in Galilee, but it seems that Jesus spent a lot of his time in a more rural agricultural area. And a lot of his parables then are drawn from that kind of life. Jesus himself was not a farmer. He was a, he was a carpenter. That was his uh, secular training, I guess you would say. And so he wasn't uh, a farmer, but, but he would have known something about farming, of course. But the point I want to make is that he was paying attention to the lives of the people around, around him. And so he picks up on the things that they're involved in and, and he picks up on their interests and he uses those things to teach them. Well, I think we can learn a lesson from that. As we deal with people and we try to have a good influence on people, we, we're listening to them. And we're trying to find out what, what they're interested in. And maybe we can make some sort of connection with them that will give us an opportunity then to teach them to spread the gospel. And so he's finding, Jesus is finding a, a common or a familiar experience, plus he's taking a, a, an interest in the lives of people that, that he's teaching. If I, went to, if, I, if I went to visit somebody and I was going to try to talk to them about the gospel and, and I see that you know, they've they got, they got their golf clubs over here in the corner and I say, you know, I, I hate golf. I think anybody that plays golf, they must be some kind of moron. Well, you know, I'm not going to get much of a chance to teach that person, am I? <laughs> and so we, we can take an interest in people, even if they're involved in things that we, we really don't know very much about. Hey, tell me about this. I don't know very much about it. How do you do that? And we're trying to make a connection with people. And we're trying to, 
kind of take advantage of those things so that we have an opportunity to know them. In maybe a few minutes, we're by trying to, to build a little bit of a relationship with people so we can have an influence on them. And so Jesus does that kind of thing as he makes a connection with the people that he's talking to by drawing lessons out of these common familiar experiences and things that they themselves have an interest in. You notice in verse 24, the first verse of the parable, that it is about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. There are several ideas conveyed by this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. In fact, I think he may use it four different ways, maybe slightly different ways here in this particular parable. He mentions it four times in verse 33 as, um, as he explains the parable down in a little bit later in verse uh, 36 and following. He, uh, and then in verses 24 through 30, he refers to the kingdom of heaven and several times during the parable. The kingdom of God has to do with the rule of God, the dominion of God, the authority of God. The, the kingdom of God has to do with God exercising His royal authority, His kingly authority, His kingly dominion. Sometimes it's the rule and the authority that's being emphasized in a passage. And so if you look at Matthew chapter 12, for example, and verse 28, uh, Jesus says, uh, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of the, the authority of God, the power of God has come upon you. If I'm casting out demons by the, the Spirit of God. And so there has to do with the rule or the authority of, uh, of, of Christ. And so sometimes it, that, that aspect is being emphasized. In Matthew 6 verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what he's saying is, seek God's will first. Seek, seek God's rule first. Seek whatever is according to His authority first in your life. Sometimes the people under God's authority who submit to that authority are under consideration. And so a little bit later in this passage, verse 38, he'll refer to some who are the sons of the kingdom. And so in that place, it's the people who submit to God's authority that are under consideration. So sometimes it's the authority itself. Sometimes it's people who submit to that authority. And so today, in our, in our day and time, the people who submit to the authority of God, what, what do we call that group of people? Well, that's the church, isn't it? And so in that sense, the church is the kingdom of God in that the church uh, is composed of people who submit to the authority of God. One writer says that it is God's reigning in the lives of men in human society, that that idea lies at the heart of the kingdom of God, that phrase, God reigning in the lives, in the lives of men and women. Well... Of course, the Jews had some mistaken notions about the kingdom of God, and people have mistaken notions today as well. The, the Jews have been looking forward to uh, the restoration of the kingdom for a long time. Ever since the captivity, they've been looking for the offspring of David who would come and establish a kingdom and, and lead the people in revolt, and they would overthrow the Roman government and Roman occupation. And the kingdom of God would be reestablished in the earth. God's king would be set on the throne, just as David ha had been. And nations would stream to them and they'd have a position of dominance once again in the world. But of course, when Christ comes and the apostles begin to teach, they, they teach that God's kingdom is not of this world. Remember Jesus before Pilate in John chapter 18? Are you a king? You know, do you have a kingdom? Well, yes, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And so... Jesus and the apostles are correcting that mistaken idea concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God exists wherever Christ rules over the hearts of men and women. And so you see that in the expression in verse 38, the sons of the kingdom. And so God's, God's kingdom exists wherever God's rule, God governs the hearts of men through Christ, wherever that is in the world. And so you can't locate it on a map. It's all over the world, spread in every part of the world where men and women submit to the authority of God through His King, Jesus Christ. 
Of course, today some people believe that the kingdom hasn't come yet. You know, we're still waiting for the thousand year millennial kingdom of, of Christ. Well, again, you know, Look at John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. And so that passage would apply to the mistaken notions of the Jews as much as uh, the mistaken notions of people today. You know, the, the kingdom in, that, in that, this sense is already here. Christ is already ruling. People are already submitting to the kingdom of Christ. And so Colossians 1 tells us that we've been translated out of the power of darkness and into his kingdom. We're already in the kingdom. Of Christ. He's already ruling. He's already exercising his authority. And as we submit to it, we become citizens in that kingdom. And there's another way in which the expression kingdom of God or the kingdom is used in the Bible. Let's go back to the Old Testament and this might help us to see this particular explanation. Now, God is king of the whole world, isn't he? Now, God just isn't just king of his people, and not king of the other other people in the world. He, he is the king of the entire world. And so, in a sense, the entire world is his kingdom. And so, look, for example, at the 103rd, 103rd Psalm in verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. God is king over all. <laughs> And that, that includes everybody, whether they acknowledge it or not, and some people don't. He is the king of all. In the 47th Psalm, we see the idea again, beginning in verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He subdues people uh, uh, under, uh, he subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us. The glory of Jacob, whom he loves. God is ascended with a shout. The Lord with a shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Verse 8, God reigns over the nations and sits on his holy throne. And so there is a sense in which all the world is under the sovereign dominion of God. And so in that sense, the whole world is the kingdom of God, as He rules over all the earth. In the book of Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we see maybe this idea uh, once again. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel sees in the night visions this, this, this dream. And uh, verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, the, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man coming, he came up to the Ancient of Days. He was presented before him. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And so, the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is a figure of universal authority and sovereignty. Some of the passages we looked at refer to God's judgment upon peoples and nations who rebel against him. And so God is the king, they don't recognize his authority, and so he comes in judgment against them. So when we read about the kingdom of heaven here in Matthew chapter 13, it seems that Jesus is referring to his rule over all the world, and not merely to those who submit to his authority. We'll see a little bit later uh, why that is, perhaps. And then there's another way in which the word kingdom is used, or kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven is used in the, in the New Testament. And that is that it refers to heaven itself. And so, in 2 Peter chapter 1, 11, If all these virtues are yours, entrance will be granted to you into the eternal kingdom. And so, heaven itself is described as God's kingdom as well. And so, this has to do with the kingdom of God. So keep all of that in mind as we proceed. The story goes that a man sowed good seed in his field, and while he was asleep, an enemy sowed tares in the field. Weeds, a certain kind of weed perhaps, were weeds in the field. And as they both sprouted up, they looked very similar. You know, you can tell the difference if you look carefully, but maybe at a casual glance you might get confused which, which was good, uh, you know, good, the, the good uh, weed and which was the, the tares or the, the weeds. But in time, they, they both grow together. And when the servants come and say, do you want us to go through the field and, and pull up the tares? Well, the landowner says, just, just wait. Just let them grow together. And in the harvest, 
well then perhaps it'll be easier for us to distinguish one from the other and we'll be able to separate the wheat from the tares. And as the story ends in verse 30, find that the tares will be bundled up and burned, but the wheat will be gathered into the barn. Now we're fortunate because in verse 36, Jesus explains the, explains the parable. It's, it's something of an allegory where various elements of the story are, are, uh, are represent other ideas. And so he begins in verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And so notice that. The field is it, it's the world. It's the, it's the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And so the sower of the seed, he goes out into the world, and he's sowing the seed, and the good seed, the plants that come from the good seed, well, those are sons of the kingdom, and the tares, the weeds, that represents the sons of the, of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and of course, he's always presented as an adversary in the, in the Bible. And the harvest is the end of the age, or we might say the end of the world, and the reapers are angels, remember, or you might take note that angels have a role to play in judgment in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus uh, describing the future judgment in terms of a separation from uh, between sheep and goats. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. You might remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the shout of the archangel. And so angels will have a role, some kind of role in judgment. And so the reapers are the angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, the... The gist of it, the, the meaning of it is that all who are stumbling blocks, all who influence others to sin, all who influence others to stumble morally or spiritually, all who act with disregard for God's law in the judgment are going to be separated and burned up. And these are represented by the tares. The righteous are going to be saved. They will shine forth as the sun in their Father's eternal kingdom. In, in heaven, we would say. And he quotes from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 there, or at least alludes to that passage. The difficult portion of the explanation has to do with the word kingdom, as, as you might expect. Earlier, Jesus had identified the field in the parable as the world, verse 38. But then in the explanation, as it proceeds, Jesus speaks about gathering out of the kingdom. And so, remember we said that God is the ruler over all the world. And he exercises authority over all the world. And so He's going to gather out of the world where the seed was sown, uh, the good and the evil, and make a separation between them. And so if this is the correct view, the message of the parable is this. Christ came to preach His gospel in the world. And then after Him, His disciples are preaching the gospel. Some accept his message, but not all. And for a time, both good people, those who accept the gospel, and evil people, those who reject it, must live and go about side by side. Sometimes it's difficult for us to distinguish the good from the evil. <laughs> sometimes evil people, at least for a period of time, will appear to be good people. And sometimes, well, I'll just leave it at that. Sometimes evil people appear to be good people. It's just hard for us to distinguish sometimes. But the time is coming when the all-knowing God will exercise His rule once and for all through the Son of Man, and the good will be rewarded and the evil punished. Well, just make two applications here as we bring our thoughts to a close tonight. One application is this. Judgment is coming. <laughs> the judgment is coming. And so you can see here in this passage... One of these days, there is going to be a separation between the tares and the wheat. And the tares, those who are 
sons of the evil one, they're going to be bundled up and burned up. And, and the sons of the kingdom, those who receive the gospel, accept it and obey it, they're going to be rewarded. They're going to be, enter into the eternal kingdom of their father. Well, this is only one place where Jesus discusses the day of judgment to come. In chapter 12, he says in verse 41, The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Noah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And so Jesus spoke of a day of judgment. There's a day of judgment coming. In Matthew 7, you remember, he'll say, Many will say to me in that day, what day? Well, it's the day of judgment, the day of judgment that's coming. And so many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lots of other passages in the New Testament concerning this day of judgment that's to come. But perhaps that, that will suffice. What we learn from these passages is that all people will stand before God. We must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Romans chapter 2 and then again in chapter 14 have a similar idea. Romans 14 in particular in verse 10 why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And so all of us will stand before God in judgment. Every one of us from the greatest to the least, male or female, doesn't matter. Our economic standing, how much power we've got, any of that. All people will stand before God, will give an account of their deeds, including their thoughts and their words. You know, he's going to judge the secrets of men, according to my gospel, Romans chapter 2 tells us. And so including our thoughts and our words, the standard by which we will be judged is the gospel. It's Romans chapter 2, and verse 10, I believe it is, Romans chapter 2, and verse 10. Um, well, no, it's really later, verse 16. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So the standard will be the gospel. And we will receive a reward or punishment according to what we have done. Especially according to what we have done as it relates to the gospel. You know? It's not just if you've done more good deeds than bad deeds, you know, you either you get in. According to our deeds, as those deeds relate to the gospel, which is the standard by which we'll be judged. You ever see something happen on the news, or maybe you know a particular situation, and you, you, you just become, oh, you're just frustrated. I can't believe they're getting away with that. I just, I can't believe it. I can't believe he's going to get away with it. No, no, nobody's going to get away with anything. Nobody will get away with anything. <laughs> because one day, an all-seeing God, who knows the hearts of men, he knows our words, our deeds, he's going to make a separation between the tares and the wheat. And so, just be patient and allow for the judgment of God. Judgment is coming. A second application is this. Until the day of judgment comes, we must live among wicked people. Well, there are going to be wicked people in the world. And so, until that day comes, we have to live our lives among wicked people. Not everybody is wicked, but there are wicked people in the world. God has not promised to remove all evil from our world. God hasn't promised to remove all evil from our communities. God hasn't promised to remove all evil from your workplace. <laughs> as a matter of fact, what he says is, as you live in the world, there's going to be a bunch of tares out there that you're going to have to just, just, just tolerate for a while until that day of judgment. They're going to be evil men, and we'll encounter some of them. I say some of them will cuss us like a dirty dog. I don't know where I came up with that expression, but this is true. You know, there are going to be some evil people that are going to hurt us. They'll curse us. They'll cheat us. They'll steal from us. They'll insult us. They'll lie to us. They're going to be thieves, fornicators, adulterers, murderers, extortioners, liars. People are going to be filled with greed and lust and jealousy, anger, violence, malice. 
prejudice, hatred, pride, ambition. There's just going to be people like that in the world. And we might as well, don't be surprised by it. Don't get frustrated by it. No, don't say, oh, give up because of it. No, you just have to be patient and work through it, keeping your eye on the judgment. Some of these wicked people will be in the church. Not, not all of them, but, but some of them. Not, not only not all evil people will be in the church, but not all people in the church are evil people. Most of them are very good people. But there are going to be some people who are not what they ought to be in the church. It's unfortunate that the criticism we hear sometimes that there are hypocrites in the church, it's, it's unfortunate that it's true. It is, it is true. Now we're not happy with that and we're trying to correct it. But until we do, the wheat will have to coexist with the tares. You know, that's why we can't put our trust in men. If we're here because of the other people who are here solely, if that's our primary reason for being here, we need to rethink our, whatever it is, our motivation or priorities or expectations or something. Now, we're not here because of the other people. Now, we benefit from them and we want to help them, and but we're here because of who God is. And we're here because of who Christ is. And they will never fail us. And they will never disappoint us. Even though there may be others around us who do, they never will. How do we persevere in these circumstances where, you know, we, we, we believe we're trying to be good people, we're trying to be the wheat, and there are tares around us? How do we, how do, we do that? How do we persevere? Well, I guess what I'll say is what I say a lot of times. <laughs> We have to trust and obey. Just trust and obey. Day by day. We understand God's will. We trust that if we do God's will, things will be put right one day in judgment. And God will vindicate His people. God will reward them, even though they may have gotten the short end of the stick in this life. God sees and He will reward. Be patient, trust and obey. And God will put things right in the judgment. See, ultimately, ultimately, God's authority and sovereignty are exercised in the judgment. And so, for the time being, God is king, He's on the throne. But for the time being, there are people that are rebellious, and they don't submit themselves to the authority of God. But one day, in judgment, God will exercise His ultimate sovereignty and dominion, and every knee will bow. And so we want to be prepared for that day. Well, if you're here tonight, you're not a Christian, hope that you've benefited somehow from our, our comments tonight about this parable. If you're ready to become a Christian, have that opportunity. Put your faith in Jesus as the Son of God who died for your sins. So repent of those sins. Confess your faith. Be baptized so that your sins will be washed away. If you're already a Christian, but you're not faithful in your service, maybe you're more like those tares than, than the wheat that we've talked about. Well, make the necessary corrections tonight. If we can help you in some way, we invite you to respond as we stand and sing together. Have you been to